Hey everyone, this is Kai Wenner from Confluent. This is part two of a three-part series about modernizing data warehouses and data lakes with data streaming. And in this section, we will actually talk about a new buzzword coming up more and more, the lake house or data lake house, and how that's related to real-time analytics and batch processing. So in the first section or part, we talked about data at rest, storing in a database or in files and then processing it later versus data in motion where you continuously process data in real time where this adds business value in many use cases. Now this is often a combination however where you combine analytics in real time and batch and this is actually what the data lake house brings you. So the lake house or data lake house is a term coined by Databricks a few years ago. They are using it more and more in their products and presentations and in the end, the main idea is that you can do analytics at rest, where it takes some longer times for processing big workloads, finding insights, training analytic models, and so on. And on the other side, you can apply data on real-time streams for X now when it's interesting, so that you can, for example, detect a fraud before it happens, or do predictive maintenance for machines before they break. So this term was coined by Databricks, but in the meantime, everybody's using it. And so, first of all, I want to really point out that um, in my understanding or definition, a lake house is not a physical view. Of course, every one of these vendors here, and we have plenty of them, right? Um, they're all telling you, get all the data into my, whatever they call that, data warehouse, data lake, or now lake house. Get all the data in there, store it there at rest, and then process it later, right? So that's okay for many use cases. Like we learned in the first, part of the series for doing reporting, for doing business intelligence, for training analytic models, and so on. However, um, with a single infrastructure storing all data there, this doesn't work well for all use cases. And so I see it really more as a logical point of view so that you can get the data into the right system for the right use cases. And most customers don't use one of these vendors for everything. They also have either several of them or they also use something like MongoDB for transactional workload or Elasticsearch for search or any other application they build. But the main idea behind the lake house, no matter if you see it as a physical view for some use cases or as a logical view in the whole enterprise architecture, the idea is to process data in the right speed at the right time with the right data for the right applications. And actually now this is where, again, data at rest and data in motion come into play into this discussion, how to build the next generation lake house or data warehouse or data lake or many of them. So we all learned in the last seven to 10 years that people use a Lambda architecture for that, right? So this was used a lot in the Hadoop era Cloudera, Hortonworks, and so on, where you were trained to use a batch layer for big workloads, put them into Hadoop or Spark, use MapReduce and these things to process it. And in parallel to that, you typically have a Kafka layer for real-time ingestion. But then you also need a serving layer to combine the data together. Unfortunately, reality is that in most cases, only the correlation of real-time and batch data provides the most business value. So you need a serving layer to combine it again. And then on the right side, you can build real-time apps in motion or batch apps, reporting, model training, and so on at rest. Another approach of the Lambda architecture is that you, is that you build really two separate serving layers, a complete separate serving layer and an independent batch layer. Then, however, um, on the right side, you need to do the mixed queries where you correlate the batch and real-time layer. And no matter which of these two options for the Lambda architecture you choose, the big problem is that you have two separate infrastructures just for the ingestion or integration layer. And that doesn't make much sense because you need to, um, first of all, pay and operate for two systems. You often duplicate workloads and um, you need to mix it together. So it's super hard. And so no matter if you want to build a lake house with Databricks or Snowflake, or typically more in reality is that you see different kind of lakes and data warehouses and other applications. The point is you don't need these separate layers. What we see a lot in cloud native infrastructures these days is that people and companies build more and more Kappa architectures, where you have a single pipeline for real time and batch consumers. So once again, uh, not everything will be real time in the future, no. Near real time, batch, request, response, different communication paradigms 
are very valid and much better for the specific use case. So on the right side, you will always have real-time batch and other communication paradigms. But the question is, why do you need a batch ingestion layer for that, separated from the real-time layer? That doesn't that make that much sense. Because if you get the data out of the data sources into the real-time layer, in an event-driven architecture, then on the right side, you can decide by yourself how to consume it. And this can be real-time, this can be near real-time, this can be batch, or this can be a web service with HTTP or something like that. And the same, by the way, also in the data sources. Not everything is coming in in real-time. So one of the most common use cases I see these days is people use data from an Oracle database or from a Salesforce CRM. And you always have the options, pulling data out of there in a JDBC query or so, or also use change data capture to pushing events into the streaming platform. That doesn't matter how you do that, but the point is the Kappa architecture is the new normal for building cloud native infrastructures and also for ingesting data into lake houses, data lakes, data warehouses. One example of that is Uber. So no surprise, right? The Silicon Valley companies are often first with these architectures, but this is exactly what I just explained. You get all the data into the streaming platform no matter if it's coming in via a gateway or web service, like from the rider and driver app in this case, where you typically use um, gRPC or REST in the middle, um, but then you get the real-time data or also historical data or batch data from a database into the streaming platform. And then on the right side, each application and business domain can decide by themselves how to build that. And again, for some it's real-time or near real-time, where in this case Uber uses Flink, for example, for some stream processing or Elasticsearch for search engine, that's more real-time or near real-time. And in their case, they also rely a lot on Hadoop for the batch workloads. And this is a super simplified infrastructure because you only have one pipeline for all the workloads, no matter if the consumers are batch or real-time or anything else. And with that, let's take a look at three different case studies from people that modernize their data warehouse or data lake, or maybe now they call it also lake house, right? And through different approaches, how to do that. The first one is from Confluent. So you might not be surprised. So Confluent is doing data streaming around Kafka, right? The company I work for actually. And in the end, even Confluent doesn't have only real-time data. I mean, we're using Kafka under the hood wherever possible and real-time beats slow data in most use cases. But for example, we're using Salesforce, a CRM system. And Salesforce is another data storage layer. By the way, also heavily built with Kafka, but it's another question. But they are storing, of course, data in their databases under the hood. And now, in the past, um, in the beginning when Confluent was founded, um, Confluent used Stitch, which is a talent company for ETL batch workloads, to getting data out of Salesforce into other systems. For example, as one data warehouse, we are using Google BigQuery in the Google Cloud. And this was a batch process, which worked in the beginning for creating reports with, Google, with BigQuery. But it was inconsistent and the updates came in late because such a pipeline is typically not just one process, but it's a complex streaming ETL integration platform where you also integrate data, not just from Salesforce, but also from other systems. And so we re-architected this at Confluent to do streaming ETL based on data streaming around Kafka. And with that, now we can push changes out of Salesforce and get them directly into Google BigQuery and also into other systems. And sometimes we also process the data in motion with the Kafka ecosystem, like with Kafka Streams in this example, for correlating information from different systems. And this is one example about how to do a cloud-native native data warehouse modernization, where in the end we replaced batch workloads at rest and moved it into an in-motion streaming platform as the integration layer into the data warehouse, into Google BigQuery, where now the queries are more consistent and more near real time. A second example is from Shipio. Shipio is um, a real-time logistics and transportation platform in the cloud. And here is also a very common scenario where um, they, in the end, are a young company. So they had a lot of applications where they started in the cloud first. So as you see in this picture on the right side for the analytical systems, they have many of the ones we know very well. But also interesting is that they don't choose just one for them. So while today, if they call, uh, do a name for their architecture, they might also call it Lakehouse because that's what people do. But as I explained, um, this is more logical view. And here you see why, because for some use cases, you use Snowflake, maybe it's best for reporting and data warehousing. And for some other advanced complex analytics, well, maybe BigQuery is the right choice. And still for some other use cases, you use a normal database with PostgreSQL. 
or because it's good enough and scales well and it's much easier to use or much cheaper, whatever the use cases are. And so in this architecture here, you see how the streaming platform builds a Kappa architecture, getting data out of existing transactional systems and then get it into other systems on the fly as fast as possible or needed. And sometimes you also do transformation and ETL in the streaming layer, if that makes sense. For example, because then you transform it only once in the streaming layer and then you get curated data into other systems. Or if you need to, you get the raw data into one of these systems. There are many SLAs you have to think about in use cases like what's your required latency and is faster better for your business? What is the cost of getting all your raw data into different systems? Or is it cheaper to pre-process it once in Kafka and then get it via Kafka Connect as curated data into a system? Right? So there are very different options here. And this is a great example of such a Kappa architecture where you modernize your cloud native data warehouses. And as the last example, this is Sykes Cottages. So they have built a fully managed end-to-end -end data streaming platform into their data warehouse and into their visualization and BI on top of that. So they had a lot of batch workloads, like most companies have in the beginning, right? Where you do some copy paste with some scripting, and then you get some updates in your warehouse and create some reports over time. In most cases, what I hear from our customers is that um, they struggle with errors and it's often slow, so the information is coming in too late or different systems have different information. Like in this case, um, can you still rent this house or is it already booked by someone else? And for these kind of use cases, even for the data warehouse scenarios, for reporting, for analytics, um, it's important to have the data in an accurate way as fast as possible. And so typically people improve their workload speed and ingestion layer from hours or minutes into seconds. And, or even if it's just from hours into minutes, it's often a big advantage, right? And therefore this is an example where, where um, Sykes Cottages moved from um, legacy file and batch based workloads with a lot of manual steps into an automated streaming platform to get, provide access to the data as soon as possible. And then each consumer again can decide how to use that. The first use case in this example might be the warehouse to get data more in more quickly and more cost efficient. But now where this pipeline is running, you can now add new and other applications around that. And this is again where we talk about a lake house. But the benefit is you don't need to do all of that with a single infrastructure relying on that technology, but you can choose your own consumer and downstream applications. And while in this case, um, Sykes, Sykes Cottages uses um, Snowflake, well, you might find out for my use cases, Databricks is the better solution. So you also tap into some of the data from the streaming platform and build your stuff with Databricks. Or maybe the data scientist says, no, I'm using Python and TensorFlow for that. Or I build a custom application with Java or .NET. This is the flexibility and true decoupling you get if you see the lake house as more a logical view on the enterprise architecture. Because what we already learned 10 years ago from the Hadoop vendors, right? Um, getting all the data into one data lake and doing all the things there, that doesn't work and there's no business value. So that's why many of these companies don't exist anymore. And also why things like GDPR enforce you to think in different ways and not get all in and analyze it together. And this is why data streaming, warehousing and data lakes are complementary technologies. And they typically work best if you choose the right tool for the right problem. And with that, thanks for watching the second part of this three-part series. In the third part, we will take a look at a concrete example how to build a connected car infrastructure for predictive maintenance using AI, using a Kappa architecture, using both real-time streaming and data at rest in data storages, in a lake house, and so on. Thanks for watching.